It is useful, therefore, to consider some of the specific influences on Gordon Craig, how he related to his peers, and for the purposes of my talk today, his sister. He reached adulthood in the 1890s, and he began middle, early middle age, if you like, with the First World War, and in 1922, the high point of modernism, he was 50. He survived his sister Edith, who was born in 1869, by 19 years. She died in 1947. And it's very, very um, common that uh, no one has heard of Edith Craig. So the who is Gordon Craig is a really, really important question. And I think the question I've been struggling with uh, to get people interested in answering is, who was Edith Craig? So Edith Craig herself had a long and productive career. Like her brother, she was trained in, um, as an actor at the Lyceum Theatre, where their mother, Ellen Terry, was one half of the successful stage couple with Henry Irving. In 1897, Edith Craig toured with Janet A. Church and Charles Charrington with productions of Ibsen's plays, when the name of Ibsen was synonymous with the most challenging and unorthodox of contemporary thought. It was Ibsen's A Doll's House, which begins with an apparently conventional middle-class family and ends with a transformed Nora, rejecting her husband, her home and children and walking out. And it's still actually a, quite a shocking um, thing to, to witness as a member of the audience. And obviously the women's suffrage activists really took on uh, a doll's house and the idea of Nora's bid for freedom, uh, they took that to their hearts. Now, in a letter to George Bernard Shaw, Ellen Terry described the effects on her daughter of mixing in these circles as giving her daughter a somewhat moth-eaten appearance, and she was rather worried. So she seemed relieved when Edith Craig became a costume designer and stayed uh, closer to home. After having made the most of the opportunity given by Irving in 1899 to make all of the costumes for the Lyceum production of the French revolutionary play Robespierre, Edith Craig launched her own costume business, Edith Craig and & Company, and this was financially supported by her mother. With this breadth of experience in perhaps the most fortunate of apprenticeships, Edith Craig turned towards the role of producer or what became known as director of plays. After a period of development, organizing tours for her mother, Edith Craig found opportunities for creative development in the women's suffrage movement, for which she became internationally known for her production. She was one of the most famous directors of women's suffrage plays, and there were many, many plays written by women and some men to support the campaign for women's suffrage. Edith Craig directed plays for many little theatres in the interwar period, and she set up her own theatre society, the London-based Pioneer Players, from 1911 to 25. It was effectively London's relatively forgotten art theatre, bringing many innovative plays to London from Russia, Italy, America and Holland. George Bernard Shaw succinctly formulated the conundrum posed by the Terry children's impact on the world in terms of an inverse proportion of fame to productivity that defined them. Gordon Craig had made himself the most famous producer in Europe by dint of never producing anything, while Edith Craig remains the most obscure by dint of producing everything. Shaw uh, refrained from passing judgment on the siblings' talents. Based on the number of plays produced statistically, Edith Craig should be the more famous sibling. So it's worth reflecting for a moment on what Shaw's motivation might have been in making this statement. He was Edith Craig's supporter, and new insights have emerged about the connections between their careers. Most significant, perhaps, is that she was a timely supporter of his plays during the First World War and in the 1920s. So in my new book, Edith Craig in the Theatres of Art, I look into this in some detail. But Edith Craig directed his play, The Inca of Jerusalem, in 1917 in London. 
and also several of his plays at the Everyman Theatre Hampstead in the early 1920s. So she was a supporter of Shaw when his pacifist politics had really seen his reputation fall. So she effectively, I think, rehabilitated his reputation. Um, and Edith Craig's role at the Everyman Theatre Hampstead has been relatively little known, partly because Norman McDermott, who ran it, um, tended to foreground his own name in the publicity. So in this talk, I'm going to be introducing a reassessment of the relationship of Edward Gordon Craig and his sister, Edith Craig, insofar as it relates to some aspects of their theatre work. I'm going to give you um, an anecdote from Edie Craig, an Ellen Terry letter to her son, and I'm going to look at a short essay by Edward Gordon Craig written um, about his recollections of Edie, and it was in a book, and it was published after Edie's death. Those three um, uh, references are, are, are crucial for what I want to suggest. So the anecdote that was very meaningful to Edith Craig, it appears in Ellen Terry's autobiography, which was written with the help of Edith Craig's female partner, Christopher St. John, formerly Christabel Marshall. And this was published in 1908. So there's a reference to it in there, and it was um, about, uh, as a child, Edith Craig, um, when her brother uh, complained and was scared of the dark, um, she apparently hit him on the head with a wooden spoon and told him to be a woman. <laughs> <laughs> so what's interesting, I think, is that Edith Craig repeated this anecdote in a talk she was giving in the 1930s, and the whole event was about reflecting on women's enfranchisement. So in that audience, that anecdote in the 1930s must have have had a different sort of meaning. Now, there is an amusing aspect to this childhood memory of a bossy sister cajoling her little brother. If told at the expense of Edith Craig herself, who was known later in life for her forceful personality. And here um, on the right, um, Pamela Pixie Coleman-Smith, the artist um, and designer of one of the most famous tarot card sets in the world, um, is there crouching, and Edith Craig is towering above her. So um, her other partner, Tony Claire Atwood, the artist, um, was actually more reserved. Christopher St. John was, like Edie, a really forceful personality. Now, I think this anecdote, there seems to have been more to it, and I'm suggesting that it points to ways in which a conflict and a rivalry was emerging between the brother and sister at that early age. It was sometimes productive and other at other times highly destructive. And it shaped their sibling relationship and it lasted into adulthood. Now, the two young Craigs had unorthodox family circumstances, even by the standards of artists and theatre folk. The effect on the children was likely to have been an additional sense of uncertainty in addition to that generated by parents going on theatrical tours. They needed to adapt to rapidly and continuously changing circumstances and different accommodation. After Terry's separation from their father, the architect and designer Edward Godwin, they had two stepfathers, Charles Kelly Wardell, the actor, and then later on, when they were adults, the children had another stepfather in 1907, <clears throat> the American actor, James Carew, <laughs> um, who was 29 years younger than the 60-year-old Ellen Terry, and uh, Carew was 31, and Edith was 38, and Edward was 36. So their, their third and final uh, stepfather was um, actually younger than them. Um, I mention these sort of age differences because it's a kind of fact of some of the relationships that Ellen Terry had with, with men. She was much, much younger than her first husband, the artist G.F. Watts. It's quite interesting in terms of um, perhaps breaking some of these conventions. But how, what I want to think about now is how would this have affected the children? 
How did they engage with them? What did it, it, it make them think about their new roles? Now, the two Terry children, nevertheless, had other father figures in the shape of Henry Irving, Bram Stoker, the author of Dracula, who is the business manager for Henry Irving at the Lyceum, and Stephen Coleridge, Ellen Terry's legal advisor. So on the one hand, um, the family circumstances appeared to be potentially unstable and unsettling. On the other hand, the children were provided with a strong sense of being loved by their mother and, and of their mother's success in the theatre. Um, as Ellen Terry became one of the most famous and well-loved performers of her day. She was one of the first modern stars of the London stage in a fiercely commercial age and one of its most highly paid performers. Ellen Terry was probably regarded by the children as occupying an entirely unique category, as a work of art and a national treasure as much as their mother. In 1889, the year that Gordon Craig was 17, John Singer Sargent depicted her in Lady Macbeth costume, a magnificently sparkling creation decorated with blue-green beetle wings. At the end of the 19th century, she earned several hundred pounds per week, allowing her to own several properties with tenants and servants. And on at least one occasion, she lent Henry Irving a vast amount of money to keep the Lyceum Theatre going, but this was kept completely secret and it's emerged in the Stephen Coleridge correspondence with Ellen Terry in the Garrick Club Library. So on the occasion of her stage jubilee in 1906, a cartoon in Punch showed Shakespeare paying homage to Ellen Terry. In 1922, she received an honorary degree from St Andrews University during J.M. Barry's term of office as rector, and in 1925, she was honoured with the title Grand Dame of the British Empire. So she went from leading quite a, an unconventional life and being effectively a fallen woman to um, being welcomed in and formally acknowledged by the royal family when they gave her a diamond brooch on her jubilee. So what kind of mother for Edward Gordon Craig was the woman who became Dame Ellen Terry in later life? Was she even-handed? Her letters demonstrate how devoted she was to both children, but she was relentless at times in her attempt to influence and control. This is particularly relevant for her son, Edward Gordon Craig. Um, he was made aware of the weight of expectations on him. He was subjected to an epistolary beating about the head from his mother. In her letters, she was always exhorting him to work hard and to be a man. However, Ellen Terry was also a profoundly controversial figure. How did her children regard this aspect of their mother and how did they reconcile it with her success and the accolades she received? This is likely to have been highly confusing and perhaps intelligible by interpreting it in terms of the unique and the exceptional. They were, all three of them, different from the rest of the world. And this would lend itself to an intense sense of destiny and entitlement and great loyalty as well, as for the two children, a sense of rivalry. I've now got three short sections. I'm going to look at aspects of their education. I'm going to look at how they both, uh, brother and sister, were fascinated with Russia. And then finally, I'm going to look at the music of Bach and I'm going to, in my title, I suggested the Bark inheritance was a significant, it's a mysterious feature of my talk. It will become clear later on. So their education, the two children shared an invented name, Craig, rewriting their status, which was designated in that period as illegitimate, a morally laden term which cast them outside the norm and beyond the law. By contrast, the sons of Henry Irving had a more conventional education, and they were destined for professional occupations, although they chose to be on the stage. Lawrence and H.B. Irving were at times quite sceptical about Ellen Terry, and in, in private correspondence, there's references to her being referred to as the wench, so rather sort of disrespectful. But there was an awareness there of their different social status. Terry reported to her son that she had great ambitions for her daughter's education, 
at Cambridge University. And she writes to Edward Gordon Craig, do you know the ED is at work to pass for Girton? It's a Quaker to pass, and I should say her spelling, like yours, would have to improve first. However, Mrs. Mallison says she can pass easily. And as all Mrs. Mallison's girls are Girton girls, she ought to know. Well, perhaps she hoped that Edith would become an honorary Mallison and some of the other achievements of the exemplary sisterhood would rub off. Um, it may have been somewhat tactless, though, this comment written to uh, Edward Gordon Craig, perhaps intended to make him raise his own game uh, at school. Formal education, particularly that of the public school variety, didn't seem to capture his imagination, and he balked at the rules and regulations. Now, Ellen Terry had an energetic son to deal with, who had become much inspired by the dramatic appeal of cowboy culture. She confided in a letter to Edith Craig about the effects of her brother's encounter with the American cowboy performer Buffalo Bill. And here she's mimicking the publicity which referred to Mr. the Honourable William Cody. Mr. the Honourable William Cody has set his, Gordon Craig's, poor little brain and heart on fire and he thinks and dreams of nothing but Bill. Mr. Cody offered to teach Ted to real ride if I'd let him join the camp for two months on a visit, but Bradfield is best for him, so he goes back this afternoon. Now, William Cody, known as Buffalo Bill, was a scout in the American Civil War and subsequently an international performer with Buffalo Bill's Wild West, and he was touring Britain in 1887 when this letter was sent. The whole Terry family seems to have joined what the press described as the Wild West fever. Ellen Terry's letters reveal more about the upbringing of the children, the difficulties that arose and how they were resolved. Both children were educated in Germany. Now, Ellen Terry discovered in October 1888, uh, in this autumn, she's working really hard, learning her lines for Lady Macbeth, which is coming out in December. So just at this difficult time, Edward Gordon Craig gets into serious trouble at school. The 16-year-old Edward Gordon Craig had apparently absconded at night on a cycling jaunt which had led to his expulsion. The details remained obscure for some time as Terry struggled to find out exactly what had happened and she enlisted her trusty legal advisor Stephen Coleridge to act as her representative. Now Terry was particularly frank about all of this in her letter to her daughter. In revealing her opinions about the situation, about her son, but also about the reaction of Stephen Coleridge, Ellen Terry seems to treat her daughter very much as an adult and an equal, as well as a confidant. I was horrified, for I knew in a moment how such a thing handicaps a lad in the future. I telegraphed for details at once. Meanwhile, I got a letter from Ted himself and from the earnest and at last grave tone of the letter, I was convinced it was entirely true, and that's all I really care for, that he should have understanding enough to know me for his friend, who would fight for him if trusted with all the truth. It was, as I imagined at once, the foolish boy had capped many acts of insubordination by what Lawrence described as breaking out of the house with two other lads at 11.30 at night and going for a tricycle ride until three or four in the morning. Stephen is furious and thinks the worst of Ted. So Terry was mortified, going through a period of disbelief and then concern for the family's reputation. I'm not quite sure whether it was the reputation she was concerned about, but certainly the school teachers are treating Ellen Terry, it seems, from her correspondence with Stephen Coleridge, with um, very little respect. So in the absence of Buffalo Bill's Mustangs, Gordon Craig had taken off on his tricycle. Oblivious to the precarious position he had in terms of social status, he seems to have been unaware of the repercussions, that any improper conduct, or perceived improper conduct, um, would bring disgrace upon the rest of his family. Stephen Coleridge was unable to rectify the situation 
and the boy and the tricycle were brought back to England. Now, Edith Craig's memoirs have not so long ago been published, and there's a reference in, in the, the memoirs uh, to uh, a time when, in fact, Edith Craig also surreptitiously went out in Germany for nighttime jaunts. How much more transgressive was her behaviour as a young woman and disguised as a man? A nighttime bicycle ride by a 15 or 16 year old schoolboy could be framed as an adventure. But uh, it's not clear exactly what happened. She was dis discovered and she was also brought home. So there are two kind of parallel um, events here. Now, the second section here is about Russia. The two uh, children of Ellen Terry were fascinated by Russia. Russia was an uh, exciting place, a centre of uh, creative innovation. And Edward Gordon Craig's interest in Russian theatre uh, and his writings in his journal, The Mask, are well known, as other speakers have pointed out. Um, Gordon Craig's uh, designs for the theatre were also put on in exhibitions, and Ellen Terry notes that she, Edith Craig, and Sarah Bernhardt were all going off together to see Gordon Craig's exhibition, and that was in 1911. Now, Gordon Craig positioned himself as in exile and neglected by an ungrateful nation, but he was on a transnational mission with his designs for his production uh, with Stanislavski of Hamlet, the Moscow Art Theatre. And in a speech um, uh, to people gathered for a dinner in his honour in London, uh, which he then publishes, he, the transcript of his, his speech of thanks in The Mask, <laughs> um, he saw himself as a representative of the European theatre. And it is as the English representative of the awakening European theatre that I am here this evening. Art is not a national thing. It is far more than that. It is a religious thing. So the mask is a really f uh, fantastic resource. It's, it's fascinating. And what I've been doing is trying to look for references to his sister. <laughs> and it, they don't appear. In the same issue of the mask, in October 1911, Gordon Craig wrote under one of the many pseudonyms he used in the journal, John Balance, and he wrote an article entitled Kleptomania at the Russia and the Russian Theatre. And he's accusing um, the, the Russian ballet people of uh, stealing tricks uh, from other lands and arts. The putative the thefts were also from, quote, the only original dancer of the age, the American, so we know that's Isidore Duncan, and another idea or two from the most advanced scene designers of Europe, and that's him. <laughs> Gordon Craig was critical of the Russian ballet and the perceived vulgarity of the costume designs. Now, what isn't, um, isn't so well known is that his sister was involved with Russian theatre uh, productions in London with the pioneer players, but she also was involved with organising the publication of a little book called The Russian Ballet, which was uh, published under Ellen Terry's name in 1913. Now, the letters in the archive reveal that this was a very rushed, um, desperate uh, project to try to raise some money because Ellen Terry had uh, become very, very ill and unable to work, and therefore many other people were financially suffering because she was supporting them. And so Christopher St. John is enlisted to write the Russian ballet. Um, this didn't raise enough funds. So in 1914, Ellen Terry, uh, with the help of Christopher St. John's commissioned writing of the Shakespeare lectures, goes on tour to Australia and New Zealand. Now, Edith Craig um, produced so many plays that we would be here for several weeks if we were going to go and discuss them all. But I want to just uh, show you quite a few slides in a row now. I'm going to not talk about them uh, very much at all. This is um, showing Edith Cray's costume designs for A Pageant of Great Women, one of the most famous and successful women's suffrage plays, which was put on all over Britain, 1910 to 1914. And here we have um, Cicely Hamilton um, in a costume which um, Edith Craig designed. And here I've set it against 
the costume design for Apis and Galatea, whether this is a kind of gesture, posture, a posture that is sort of just enhancing the draping of the of the sleeves, or is there something, some memory being kind of repeated here? Quite fascinated to know to what extent Edie was involved in the design of that one. Um, the Pioneer Players put on many plays for their members in London um, between 1911 and 25. In 1914, they also had a costume ball, and I think there was um, a, a competition for tango dancing, and uh, Ellen Terry um, goes off to Australia just after this. Uh, Edie Craig puts on a play by Rotsfeet, a 10th century nun, said to be the first female playwright ever, and it's translated from Latin into English by Christopher St. John. It's produced by Edie in London for the Pioneer Players. It's a really historic occasion, and Ellen Terry appears in it. There's a play uh, by Nikolai Evrenov, the Russian dramatist, The Theatre of the Soul. This is a monodrama, it's expressionist, it's really avant-garde, and it, Edie directs it, 1915 and 16, in London. And there are her lighting designs, um, just to the side. She puts on A Merry Death by the same playwright in 1916 for the Pioneer Players. Pan in Ambush, a comic play, is put on in 1916. And we have a costume here that is rather reminiscent of Nijinsky in La Primidi de Forme. Now, um, in 1912, Edith Craig's Pioneer Players put on Hamlet. <laughs> um, and she doesn't direct it, apparently. It's directed and acted by Louis Calvert. And he's interviewed here and to say that so far as scenery and costume are concerned, Sunday's performance will be given in the simplest and plainest way. And I prescribe the excellent remedy of absence to anyone who may be expecting our presentation of Hamlet to amaze the eye with the expensive glitter of modern production. So I wonder who he's referring to there. It's going to be very straightforward. And Edith Craig is also interviewed in the same article, and she says, we are not setting ourselves to do more than air a theory remarked Miss Edith Craig, and I echo Mr. Calvert's warning to those who may be looking for anything scenically ambitious. It will mainly be a presentation in character and costume of Mr. Calvert's analysis of Hamlet's brain. So the, the sort of comparison with what Edward Gordon Craig was doing was sort of hanging in the air there. Now my third and final section here is on the Bark Inheritance. For Edith Craig, the earliest memories of her attempt to shape her little brother's view of the world were long-lasting. When her younger brother showed fear of the dark, Edith had admonished him firmly with a wooden spoon about the head, instructing him to be a woman. This anecdote about femininity, reported by Craig herself at a women's suffrage commemorative event in the 1930s, reveals perhaps the significance for the adult woman of the little girl's response to a family environment where performance and imagination held sway under the protectorate of a fearless mother. Gordon Craig remembered his sister not making costumes, acting or directing plays, but playing the piano. When she was in Germany, she was being trained uh, in, in her musical education and she wanted to be a pianist. And she had apparently rheumatism, which affected her ability to carry on with this. So he remembers her playing the piano, and his contribution to the collection of essays published two years after Edie's death, Edie Recollections of Edith Craig, was a three-page essay, and it's entitled Edie Playing. All of the other contributions from people like Vita Sackville West um, and various women's suffrage supporters who, and collaborators with whom she worked um, are writing about her productions in quite a lot of detail and how significant she was in an international context. And Edward Gordon Craig's essay is about a rather sort of whimsical moment where he is describing Edie cajoling Ellen Terry in terms of uh, playing the piano together. So it's a very odd essay and it's always puzzled me. And I think I've, I've felt rather angry <laughs> that he, he didn't kind of say anything about her theatre work. Now, I just want to um, highlight a couple of things from this. This is the book, Edie Recollections of Edith Craig, 1949 publication. 
and it starts, how right of Edie, and what? Of the nice tilt of her nose, or of her dancing, or her way of playing the piano. I can so often hear her playing the piano now that I could write on and on about this, forgetting that it can only interest me or my mother, since we too were always present when Edie began to play. So only a word or two. I thought she played splendidly. That's the way it begins. Let me get the sort of description of Edie cajoling the mother playing the piano. And then right at the end, yes, you will say, but why all these trifles about such a remarkable being as Edith Gray? Why not tell us of her genius? But bless your heart, we had so much genius in the house of Terry that we all took that as a matter of course. So it's crucial, I think, to bring into this the, the fact that Ellen Terry's letters reveal more of the substance and importance of this memory. Craig's genuine musical talents were highly valued by the world-class composer, Dame Ethel Smythe. So she, in her autobiography, she writes of Edith Craig being one of the few, there's only about five or six people mentioned, who are excellent um, musicals of experts and um, with musical skills. And Ethel Smythe is also a really major figure in lesbian history, as is actually Edith Craig and Claire Atwood, Tony Atwood and Christopher Sindron. Now the sibling rivalry was inadvertently exacerbated by Terry at times in sowing the seeds of aspiration and trying to motivate the children ever to do more. At times she set them in competition and I think it was sort of inadvertent. And reading the letters, it's very easy to um, overinterpret them. If somebody writes something in one letter and then you're looking at it, you know, 100 years later, you can sort of make rather a lot of one little comment. But it seems to me a letter of 1902 is very revealing. There's an insightful anecdote um, by Ellen Terry, which I think helps the reader to make more sense of Gordon Craig's essay, Edie Playing. Now, Ellen Terry in 1902 wrote to her son about the music of Bach, and she recalled her passion for playing Bach's music and committing two hours every evening to practice so that she could improve when playing it with Edward Godwin. The anecdote demonstrates Terry's perseverance, that she, she didn't give up, you know, and her, also her, her own appreciation of music. Significantly, it reveals the shared understanding of Bach that triangulated Godwin, Ellen Terry, and Edith Craig, and it actually excluded Gordon Craig. So Ellen Terry writes to her son, Edie understands Bach better than any kind of music. Do you know that? And we too understood it. But at first it seemed impossible to get through with it at all. But practice, practice we did every evening from about 9 to 11. But the organist of the village did not feel it half as understandingly as your father, who somehow got thunderous climax. But learning it on the organ was fine for me, I tell you. The wonder to me about Purcell is that he was before Bach. Now, Gordon Craig's letters to his mother occasionally refer to his own musical appreciation, including a performance of Bach. As if to provide evidence to change his mother's mind, he too knew and understood Bach, not just Edie. Now, the memory of the Bach inheritance and his own dispossession seems, I think, to have informed Gordon Craig's recollection of Edith Craig. An appreciation of music was something which, for their mother, differentiated the two children. As Terry noted tactlessly in the same letter to her son, you were extraordinarily bored by music when you were little. Odd, wasn't it? So Terry's emphasis on the bark inheritance, I think, casts new light on Gordon Craig's choice of topic for his contribution to Eleanor Adlard's collection. And he focuses on his sister's musical talents in easy playing. And he also ends up at the end of the essays referring to her genius, but it's the genius of the house of Terry, including him. Now, Edith Craig is for the most part omitted from Gordon Craig's publications. He simply just doesn't mention her and she's putting on the most amazing avant-garde plays of, of, of the time. 
and they are simply not mentioned. So Edith Craig is a silence, a gap in Edward Gordon Craig's writing. She features only very briefly in Index to the Story of My Days when he notes her response to his performance uh, as an actor in 1892 in Margaret. And, he, and this is the entire entry for this one day. My sister Edie came down to see me play Ford in The Merry Wives and said later that I was pretty good in it. This from her was high praise, though praise never got me got much further into me than the ears, and so never harmed me. <laughs> but what it seems to be is significant in this context, bringing these specific references together now, we see an intense connection between Edith Craig and Edward Gordon Craig throughout their lives, and he appreciated her, her talents and skills in the world of the theater and her musical talents. Um, but he, he very rarely mentions it in, in, in print. So this intense significance that his sister played in his life, I think, is suggested by these silences and omissions. But the two followed parallel lines in their pursuit of the art of the theatre. And they were, they were both aiming for an aesthetic coherence in the production. But they disagreed on the role of the actor in the enterprise. Edith Craig was very much concerned to bring in the views of the actor and the writer um, uh, into her productions. Uh, but they also disagreed on the abilities of women. And um, you know, that was sort of a, perhaps a, a point of contention. So I just want to uh, close with um, mention of, of my uh, current project. I uh, catalogued the Ellen Terry and Edith Craig archive for the National Trust and the descriptions of uh, to over 20,000 documents are online. Um, I should say I had help from other people. I sort of led this project. I think I entered data for 7,000 of them on my own to start off with. But this, um, the, the archive is uh, all described on this, uh, this website. And recently, I've had more funding to enhance this resource. More and more family history researchers were getting in touch with me to find out about uh, their theatrical ancestors. And so I've had another project which is just coming to an end and it's called Searching for Theatrical Ancestors. So some of the, on the same uh, web address, there's other pages that you can look at and other resources to do with searching for um, theatrical ancestors. And in amongst all of this, there's also a page called the Shakespeare Train and we've digitized some Shakespeare play programs from the Lyceum tours and from Ellen Terry's Shakespeare lecture tours. And these are um, available on, on the same uh, website. And you can actually see uh, the tours marked on a map um, of the world. So it's quite a fun way of uh, engaging with the material. So thank you very much.